What I'd like to do today is to talk about um, one of the greatest needs in modern education, and that is to understand that there is a unity and an intricate connection between different things in, in, uh, in knowledge. So that whether it's mathematics or empirical science or metaphysics, whatever it is, it's important to understand that there are connections and themes that run throughout. The three themes that I want to talk about today, because ultimately they lead back to God, are truth, goodness, and beauty. These are called, of course, the transcendentals, meaning that they are things, they are, they are let's use modern language, they're qualities of things that exist in everything. Everything that is natural and that, but transcend the thing itself. Now, this is important because you have to make a conceptual step here. Here's what people think. People in the modern world, you just grow up in America or Europe or anything like that, your tendency to think is this. Things that are like this are real. Uh, so the flowers outside are real. This is constructed, but it's real. And then there are ideas that people have. Now, um, Westerners are split. Uh, they're kind of like intellectual schizophrenics. They believe on the one hand that the physical world is what's really real. And ideas and feelings are not really real. Those are just subjective. They're not something you can negotiate, knowledge-wise. Uh, but on the other hand, they're convinced that people can make up a reality inside their heads, and that reality can be real to them, and even more real than the physical reality. And the whole gender ideology that we're uh, confronting today is a part of that. Here's what I'd like to look at today. I'd like to look at the question then of truth, goodness, and beauty by rethinking what the relationship is between things that we can see and things that we can't see. Truth, goodness, and beauty are not, I'm going to repeat that, truth, goodness, and beauty, TGV, truth, goodness, and beauty are not ideas that we attribute to the physical world. Truth, goodness, and beauty are realities in the world, but they're behind the world, so to speak. They are behind and above, which is the meaning of the word metaphysics. You know, metaphysics is the word that there's two words in ancient Greek, metaphysikain, which means after the physics. In other words, after or beyond, that to be like bent the data or something like that. So, meta, if something is meta, it's beyond uh, the first level anyway. So, truth, goodness, and beauty are meta, not metaphysical ideas, but metaphysical realities. If they were not realities, you couldn't bat your head up against them. But you can. How do you bat your head up against a metaphysical idea? Let me show you. I'd like you to point where I can see the number two. Well, I see fingers. Mm -hmm. So that's a metaphysical. That that's a. I saw fingers. That's a two. Well, if I have my pen, I'd write two out. Okay. But that's just a symbol. That's a symbol. That's a convention. Right. What is two? It is actually to cut short because of time. It's actually a concept. And if I put two and two together, I get four. 
But if I say that 2 and 2 equal 5, have I butted myself up against reality? I have. Because even though it's abstract, even though it's a concept, it's real. And the fact that I can get things wrong in mathematics is proof that there's a reality that's abstract. Because mathematics is very abstract. And uh, that's why kids have a hard time with it, especially early in life. And so we use things like this. We use things to count, to make it concrete. But reality, mathematics is not really concrete at all. It's a metaphysical reality. So that's the first point to understand that we are going to talk about truth, goodness, and beauty in education. All right. Now, let's go on very quickly then. Why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about it for this reason. Because modern education is absolutely the savior of the world. It solved all of our problems. And if you think I'm being hyperbolic, just look at some of the literature that educationists were writing, oh, I don't know, maybe in the 70s or in the 50s. They really thought that if we just got the educational system right, we would be able to, you know, solve all the ills of mankind. People identify, but what was the problem? I'm going to ask for your judgment. Schools today, let's say schools in general, public schools, are they better in 1950 or 1950 to 2015? Were they better in 1950 or in 2015? New York City, 1950. New York City, 1950. Forgive me for not getting immediately the significance of that answer. Explain. New York City had a very good school system in 1950, and in 2015, it is gone away. Yeah. I think that story would be repeated many times over. What went wrong? What were the problems? Let me suggest, let me think about for just a moment. Here's the problem. There was a misidentif misidentifying the sources of the problems. One of those problems that I'm going to argue against was what I would call pragmatism or utilitarianism. Pragmatism or utilitarianism is it's got to be practical. And I hear this over and over and over again. The problem is that practical doesn't mean utilitarian. Utilitarian or pragmatic doesn't mean practical. Of course we have to be practical. But when you limit knowledge to the solution of problems in the immediate, you lose the bigger vision. There was also a misunderstanding of the goals of education. What is the goal? Well, when American corporations and business and the public in general, because we are very pragmatic and utilitarian as Americans, we thought that the goal of education was to produce workers. But in 1950, I'll bet you in New York public schools, let me go back to 1920. Did you know I have textbooks, Latin textbooks that were taught in the 1920s in the New York public schools. And in two years, when they got through Julius Caesar's game of course, it would take people two years of college now to do the same thing in high school as well. They really mastered it. Talk about this in just a moment. They still had the ideal that education was about the formation of human persons on a holistic scale. Now, you'll hear educators talk about this, but in fact, most of it is simply the goals of education. Well, for one thing, it's even worse. In some cases, it's to give them a certificate that makes it look like they've been through school. And Americans, if you haven't noticed, are absolutely obsessed with credentials. And I've often thrown out the challenge. Look, if somebody walks in and says, Hey, I could teach third year Latin in college. I'd say, okay, I'll give you a test and we'll see. You pass it, you can teach it. It doesn't matter whether you have a degree in Latin. Uh -huh. 
I've never taken one class in Latin. I taught myself Latin. And I've been reading it for 30 years or more now. Yeah, more like 35 years. All right. I'm not great at it, but I'm not too bad either. What, what do you need to take a class for? What do you need a degree for? Competence is what we should be searching for. But the American education system, both Catholic and, and, uh, and public, is often much about, it's much about uh, credentials. And then there's the misunderstanding of the human person. What does the human person need? And in order to get that, I think the reason is they think that the human person, if you look at the world only economically, only in terms of having a job, then you think that that's going to make somebody happy. But they forgot about my friend named Alden. Went to high school with Alden. And so I went to seminary. We went, both went to college. I went to seminary and he went to law school. We met back up in the same hometown. And I got, oh, Alden, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm working for such and such a law firm. And he says, Ken, I'm bored to tears. I can't do this the rest of my life. What are you going to do? Well, I'll go back and take my dad's insurance business. And he did. Nothing wrong with law, but, but it wasn't for him. But you know what he was told? You get the right job, make enough money, you'll be happy. And it was a lie. Well, that's some of the misidentification of the problem. What are some of the solutions that we have? Well, we've already indicated them, indicated them somewhat, but the solutions that people want today are vocational training, to train people to do jobs, which is a great thing. At the Catholic high school, when I last year was my sort of first half year, and there was a young man graduating in the senior class, and I remember talking to him, and I said, Zach, so what are you going to do after high school? Well, I'm going to go over to Parkland as a community college. I'm going to go over to Parkland, and I'm going to, you know, study auto mechanics. That's great. Just don't forget to read Shakespeare and the Bible and so forth after, in the evenings after you've fixed all those cars. But, you see, so it's great. We do need people like We need tradesmen. Not everybody has to go to college. But if we are going to have higher education, we need to see it as beyond vocational training. And particularly, you know, I want to summarize this. I don't want to go through these one by one necessarily, but to summarize it this way. How many of you are lawyers? How many of you are teachers? Business people? Medical people? Okay. You all have specialized knowledge. You know more about the human anatomy than I'll ever know. I probably know more about ancient Greek than you'll ever know. All right. We all specialize knowledge. But what do we all need in common? That is especially at the high school, unfortunately even at the college level. We need that kind of an education, which is the groundwork, the liberal education, which is upon which the vocational training can be, um, can be built. Here's another example to illustrate that. I want to ask those of you that have studied law, because it's close to theology and the way that the education is conducted. Uh, without sounding too braggadocious, I was one of the best students in my seminary when I was going to theology school. Why? Because when I was an undergrad, I had already learned Greek and Hebrew, at least the rudiments of it, I had immersed myself in history, I had immersed myself in philosophy, and there were guys coming in there with business degrees. They were studying graduate level theology, and they didn't have the background. Is it true in law as it is in theology that the more background knowledge you have, the better you're going to be at that profession? Is that possible? Is it true? You think so, George? I agree. Yeah, same is true in theology. And I'll bet the more, I bet it's true in every of the so called you know, higher professions. The more you know as a background, the better you're going to be at that particular profession. One other point on this slide that I want to, is that uh, today, and I see this in the young people especially, they are being acculturated to the idea that the acquisition of knowledge is the management of information. 
That is the death knell to true learning. Learning is not something to be managed. Learning is something to be participated in, to be a part of it, where it comes back into you and lives inside of you. That's why if you look at talk to, you talk to uh, homeschool classical educators, my, my daughter is doing this with her children, so I'm a part of, of the young people that are, young families that are doing this in our city. And uh, you know what they do? They really emphasize memorization. Now you would think, well at least I was told when I was young, oh that's bare, you know, rude, bare memorization. It's, we don't need that, you know, higher level thinking. You know how you get the higher level thinking? Mm -hmm. By memorizing, by internalizing it first. Because memorization in medievals had a really clear idea about this. They thought of the memory not as bare rote memorization, but as internalization, so that it became a part of you and never left you. And that's why they, that's why they emphasized so much memorization at the lower level. Finally, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, the, the, the ideal that's in modern, modern educational theory is let's expose people to a wide range of possibilities. Yeah? It's what I would call cafeteria education. And, and I don't know about all the fields. I couldn't exactly tell you, but I can tell you this. It doesn't work in language. People come out, we are, we are the, one of the most, of all the industrialized countries, we are one of the worst with regard to languages. Now, why are we that way? It's because of our culture. We don't, we just dabble in language, we don't master them. Right? Do you know the people like Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, they could speak, write, and read, speak, and write, and write by the time they were 12 years old? And they could do it fluently. They wrote all their books. Kepler, I've got a number of his books at home, of the 36 volumes. And they're all in Latin, a few, a few things here and there in German. But he wrote and spoke Latin fluently. Well, that's one example. But here's another example, because I know a little bit about mathematics. So we teach him algebra, and what we call algebra 1 and algebra 2 is just algebra. The pre-algebra is still, pre-calculus is still algebra. So we go up these steps, we go through geometry, and they learn how to solve problems, but do they understand the mathematics? My mathematics teachers, friends tell me, very rarely do they really understand it. You know what they, you know what they used to do in the 16th century? They would master Euclid. And Euclid is, and always has been, the prime example of what the greatest mathematics is. Because it's deductive, it's axiomatic and so forth, right? So this relates to the point I want to make in just a moment. Let me go a little bit. What is needed? What we need is, go to the second point. We need multa, non multa. This is a classical, uh, uh, you might say, adage, uh, belief. We need to train people deeply in things, not in a dabbling in a lot of different things. Because when I was studying philosophy, I had a very wise uh, Presbyterian Christian uh, teacher who taught me, he said, learn one system very well, and then from that ground you can go to other systems of philosophy and understand it. I just wish it hadn't been Descartes, or it hadn't been, it hadn't been uh, I wish it hadn't been Thomas, or maybe Aristotle. Then I would have been closer to the truth than if I had learned Kant. And I learned a few of these modern systems before I learned the ancient systems. Then what is, what is needed? Instead of vocational training, we need human formation to make people good. Monsignor and I were talking, was it last night, that we need pipe fitters, we need carpenters, but what about if they're not moral men? What about if they're going to try to cheat you in your business? We need human formation as much as we need technical knowledge. Then we also need an integrated curriculum, and that's what was really good about classical languages, is that it brought about an integrated curriculum. And I can explain that in more detail. But then the final point that I've already made, knowledge is not to be managed. 
It is to be participated in. All right, let me go on quickly now. Then, so let me talk about, we'll talk about truth, goodness, and beauty. Real quickly now. I talked about a little bit about it before, so let me go back. Truth, first of all. Truth is Catholic. That is Catholicos. It is universal. Truth does not belong to one group or people. It belongs to all. And therefore, because all truth is God's truth, when God has revealed something to us, either naturally or supernaturally, which is what we usually call revelation, but when God has made something known, whether it's force equals mass times acceleration, or whether it's, you know, the two angle that, you know, two, uh, three, all the angles of a triangle equal two right angles, or whether it's the beauty of God's trinity, all truth belongs to us. That's just about a translation from St. John, excuse me, St. Justin Martyr's second apology. Truth is the same for everyone. True or false? Believed or unbelieved? Not believed. Right? Now, what you might get is this. There was a graduate student getting a PhD at the University of Illinois in plant biology. And for a couple of years, we had some graduate courses in theology that we were teaching, well, like just a year. He started taking the courses, so he told me this story. There was a professor of biology coming from England, and she was sitting around talking with some of the graduate students. And she threw out the question. Now, all of you who are graduate students, you're getting PhDs in biology. Where are you really learning to think? And he pops up and says, in theology class. Uh, oh, theology class, what do you mean? Yeah. How can that possibly be? Because then the other people in the group betrayed or, or rather showed in their thoughts the same thing he had heard before. Biologists are enculturated into a belief system. Sadly, it is true. And that belief system says this. Anything that's testable, physically, anything that's physical, that's real, that's knowledge. Everything else is opinion. So moral judgments, those are just opinion and so forth. But the truth is not only Catholic, it's not only for all, but, um, I forgive my misspelling, it's plenary, it's full. And that's what we should be leave, leaving our children and our students to believe in and to search after the truth. You see, if you have a pragmatic view of education, if you have a vocational view of education, just get enough knowledge to get the job done, then people are not going to be truth seekers, do you see? And you won't be able to have a conversation with them about what is true and what is false. And what are the, what are the two demons here? Well, I've already mentioned them, but the false philosophies about truth, scientism, not science, scientism, that is, that only what can be shown through empirical science is true, everything else is opinion. Scientism is a modern myth. Have you ever heard of a man named Wendell Berry? Mm -hmm. Wendell Berry wrote a very good book about this. I can't remember the name of the book now, suddenly it escapes me. It's something like Life is a Miracle or Life is Wonderful or Something like that. But what he does in his brilliant, he's one of the most brilliant essays in modern America. It's getting pretty old now. But this book he wrote, my daughter-in-law read it and recommended it to me. He talks about the superstition of scientism. And I think that's a good way of putting it. In other words, these people act as if. Because you see, science is an as-if story. Think about it for just a moment. What science does is it limits things to efficient causes, to use Aristotelian terms. And, if, and that's fine. That's the nature. It's called methodological naturalism. It's a good thing to be that way. Because that's all that science can study. But when you make the ontological claim, when you say then that that's all there is, then you may, you've leaped way beyond methodology into a claim about reality. Because That's what scientism does. It's open-ended hypothesis. 
What's that? Science being open-ended hypotheses. It's an experiment that's ongoing, so to speak. Well, that's true too, but it's not open. It's not open-ended upward. It's only open-ended literally. Okay, that's you're right. I mean, science is always provisional, except with mathematics, of course. But he, so that's I would say that's a false philosophy, and that is kids do pick that up in some way, shape, or form because teaching is always more than what's on the page, right? They pick up attitudes, they pick up ideas from the teacher, and the teacher conveys those attitudes. It's part of the game. You can't you can't avoid it. There's the other one that distinguishes the Catholic view, and that's biblicism, and that's to say that we believe the Bible, evangelicals are fundamentalists believe the Bible, but as far as God is concerned, they only believe what is, that the Bible is the final authority of things. Now, let me qualify that. It depends on what kind of Protestant you are. I happen to be a Protestant where we did embrace actually a more Augustinian and Catholic view of science and so forth. So it's not everybody that believes that. But you're going to find some among Missouri Synod Lutherans, among free evangelical free people, and they will think the Bible is the sole and ultimate source of truth. Here's what St. Thomas Aquinas taught, and it's what's true for us, is that there are four kinds of truth. Now this is really important, and I'm going to show you that scientism is false. Scientism must be false. I'm going to show you right now. So, could you agree with that there's a kind of truth that's logical and mathematical. There's two. There's one that's arithmetic, another that is geometric. Right. Is that the same kind of truth as an empirical truth? Two parts water, one part oxygen? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and water. Is that the same kind of truth as two plus two equals four? It's not the same kind, but they're both true. So huh? It's not the same kind, but they're both true, so it is the same. Both, both. No, that's, that's, you might say, to use a slippery term, that's its truth value, that they're both true. They're not false. That doesn't mean they're the same kind of truths. Now, how would you know that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Well, let me give you a, a little bit more realistic one. How would you know that there are triplets of numbers like 3, 4, and 5, that satisfy the equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared. How would you know that? If that's true. Figure it out. Yes, how do you do it in mathematics? You figure it out. You figure it out and use more. Yeah. You can actually prove that it's true. And by proof, I mean you could, it was proved in antiquity. This is proved over 2,500 years ago. And the truth value of that statement has never changed. Okay. Now, is this statement true? The Earth is encircling the Sun right now. How many of you believe that? Say it's not. Is, is going around the Sun right now. The Earth is going around the Sun right now. How many of you believe that? If we lived in the year 500 AD, we would believe most likely that the sun is encircling the earth. Has it been, has it been shown that the sun is not encircling the earth? Has that been shown? There are some that believe say that it's doing that. Was it shown? And let's say, let's agree for a moment, it hasn't been shown. Okay. You know why, by the way? because of what the gentleman in the back said. You can refute things in science, but you can't ultimately prove them things in empirical science. You know why? Because empirical science is an open-ended procedure. It always has the possibility that it could be proven false, a theory that's believed. We believe that force equals mass times acceleration, and in every instance in which we do it, by the way, that's not as simple as it looks, because there's a lot of abstraction involved. Uh, nevertheless, it could be proved wrong someday. There have been physical propositions that have been proved wrong. So we learn in faith. People, teachers, teach us that it's true. 
and we accept it by faith. We haven't figured it out for ourselves. Now there, you've got the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher. A good teacher would help them to figure it out for themselves. And it would help them to see that those kinds of truths are not the same. That truth about a squared plus b squared equals c squared has never <coughs> changed. Why? Because truly mathematical statements never change. But you see, force equals mass times acceleration, the universal law of gravitation, is not a mathematical truth. It's a physical truth. Do you see the difference? Two plus two equals four is a mathematical truth. And it's different. Phys truth, truth and science can change. They might not change for a long, long time. Just like Ptolemy's theory didn't change for a long time. It wasn't refuted for a long time. But what about moral truth? Well, in the majority, everything revolves around me. Huh? Everything revolves around me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so the center of the universe. So the sun. Just yeah. You can verify <laughs> that you are the center of the universe. <laughs> Killing the innocent is always wrong. I think I heard that earlier today. Killing the innocent is always wrong. You know what? That little experiment I did with the young mother nursing and then killing her baby. There are people that have doubts about whether that was wrong. And then I gave him, I, mean, I tried to be really gentle and kind, I said, I don't think the problem is that that's not wrong. The problem is you don't have any vision to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so could there be a, a opposing or contradictory moral truths? Somebody holds a entirely different view than I would, and so I think they're wrong, but is it just an opposing moral truth? Well, you have to ask a lot of questions about that. Now, let me do it very quickly and then move on. And we'll be talking about it later. Um, moral truths are always, moral truths are always um, relative to certain assumptions or presuppositions. So part of the reason they have presuppositions, that they, people can have different presuppositions. Now, you can argue presuppositions as well, but that's another step that's more complicated. Let me give you another example. Um, the, sometimes people are just confused. Let me give you one. I, I mentioned this to someone earlier. Let me give you one. Why is abortion okay? Because it's the woman's choice. I don't believe that abortion is okay. So what would I say to a person that says, it's the woman's choice? That's her body. And I would say, and I'd say, you know what I should say, to clarify the nature of the moral question, you're absolutely right. I'm not going to make that decision for her. But that doesn't answer the question about whether she'll make the right decision. You see what people do is they, they, they use language to obfuscate the true nature of the question. That's why philosophy seems so difficult to people. It's because there are brilliant people who use obfuscation to, to, to muddy the waters that could be rather clear. If you made certain assumptions, if you assume that the mother, the young mother, that the baby's life and her life are both equally valuable, then you'd have to come to the judgment that taking the life of the baby is wrong. Right? Of course, relativism is self-defeating. Because as soon as you say something is wrong, whether it's the bombing of Iraq, or whether it's the killing of a baby, or whether it's not getting funding for the poor, whatever you say, you're no longer a moral relativist, are you? <coughs> because you made a negative judgment and said this thing is wrong. When, with your theory, you said, oh, it's okay. How about metaphysical truth? Well, this is a big, big question, and it's very, very complicated. But this, by the way, is why we need schools where the questions of metaphysics are not a priori, that is ahead of time, excluded. To understand what a human person is. So here's the question I ask. I'll take one of the young ladies in my class, and I'll stand her up in front of the class, and I'll say, okay, I want you to see. So this is, uh, Kate. She's one of my students. Kate. 
Now look at Caleb. And if I could, if I could uh, tell you, if I knew everything about Kaylee's physical body, from her brain neurons down to the lowest level inside her cells, if I knew her body exactly and completely, would I know Kaylee? And you know the answer they give? Everybody in the class? Now they're are they as old and intelligent as you? They're not. They're 16 years old. And I say, would I, if I could give you the, all that information, would I know Kaylee? Do you know what answer they give? No. Because intuitively, instinctively, they know that a human person is not the sum total of his physical being. You see? Well, yeah. But that is the natural human response until you get beat out of you in, in college. I was going to say, what would a college student answer? Well, you see, well, I'm going to take the other conversation I had. So it was this coffee shop we used to lie down by the University of Illinois, and I'd go down there and I'd do some work, you know. And so they had a conversation on the table next to me, and there's this guy who's just discovered philosophy. And oh, he's enamored. And he's not sure that the wall is yellow. I said, is that wall yellow? He's not sure. Because his yellow might not be my yellow. This is amateur philosophy. Okay, but he got enamored with it. And, so, and that's, it's, it's an irrational skepticism. Right? And that's, what's, that's the, the spirit that one picks up in a lot of universities. It's kind of an irrational skepticism. By irrational, I mean it denies the obvious. Right? Okay, let's move on very quickly. But these four kinds of truths, and any school which doesn't engage these four kinds of truths is somehow deficient in its education. Why? Because instinctively, why did they answer the way they did? Why did they say no? Why did they know that Keely is more than the sum of her body? Because they know a human person. They have a metaphysical instinct. You see? They know, we know instinctually that a human baby is more important than a whale until we get ideologized into the whale philosophy. Something like that, you see. What about goodness? Let's call scientism and materialism very quick. I see my time is moving along. Uh, let me say this. I am more convinced than ever. I actually was, always was at a sub-rational level, I always believed in natural and moral law. But I didn't have the education as a Presbyterian to articulate that. Then when I became a Catholic and read, read and talked with the people about it, I began to realize that natural and moral law is the only objective basis upon which we could have agreement. But it is rejected. And I think there's a reason why. I'll ask you in a minute what you think the reason is. But here's what it is. I talk to people in law schools, people in philosophy departments. Why is natural moral law? Now, what is natural moral law? Just to make sure we're all on the same page. It is the idea that embedded in the nature of things, the natura rerum, in the nature of things, there are moral obligations they are suggested. And so forth, if I have, if I'm on the boat, and we're out in the middle of nowhere, and I have the choice to throw the little dog over the side or the little baby over the side, I choose the dog. Because it's not as high on the scale of being. And so forth. Uh, that's probably a bad example. Mm -hmm. But uh, I could use other examples that would perhaps be better. I just can't think of the top of my head. But here's the point. And here's, here's what phenomenologists, Catholic phenomenologists have said. Morality, and I should have written this down, morality is a response to reality. Morality is a response to reality. It's not making up reality. It's taking the reality in front of me, and then it is knowing the proper response to that reality. So whether it's sexual things, or whether it's 
financial things or whether it's what uh, environmental things. What's the proper response? Now, as I mentioned in my earlier talk today, this is the greatest deficiency in modern education. People that are incredibly brilliant, incredibly learned, they do not know how to even begin to do moral reasoning. They've never been trained. They've never been challenged to do it. Let's go quickly. Finally, beauty. We all do have, believe it or not, we all do have an instinctive, a natural, aesthetic sense. We can recognize beautiful things. Children, when they're young, you'll notice, they can recognize beautiful things, and they turn away from things that are not so beautiful. So I was trying to explain to my students the other day that beauty is not only in the eye of the beholder. And that there's more something. So what makes something beautiful? But all you got to do is ask the question, why can people from Africa, Asia, Europe, and South America, why can they all look at the same picture and say, that's beautiful. They can look at another picture and say, that's ugly. Now, it's not, it's not 100% because people might have different reasons why they think this is more beautiful than that. But it's not random. Let's perform an experiment. Which of these two paintings is more beautiful? There's Jackson Pollock, number 31. Is that painting more beautiful or is that one? Or how about this one? Rembrandt, the disciples in the boat on the sea when Jesus came to them. Raphael, you know what this one is? It's in the back. Huh? The disputation of the sacrament. You see the Eucharist in the middle of the altar. You've seen this picture before. Why would people say that that is not as beautiful as that? Or that? Because beauty has objective features that people can recognize. Here's some of them. Symmetry. Symmetry as opposed to asymmetry or disorder or chaos. This looks like it is just exactly what it looks like. Paint thrown against a canvas, which took no doubt at all. all right? And by the way, this is what Roger Scruton mentioned. Roger Scruton talks about what happened in 20th century art. It was a rebellion against beauty. Now this is something I just found hard to believe because I don't want to ascribe, ascribe bad motives to people, but it turns out it's true. And I've talked to art historians, my friends, who are PhDs in art history, and they say, it's probably true. They actively rebel against beauty. Look at the symmetry behind that. The, the arch. The people on both sides. Do you see? And it's against that background of symmetry that the figure holds up his hand as he's holding forth, verbally and physically. He, sh he stands out because he's against that background of symmetry. Proportion. Have you ever seen Salvador Dali? Surrealism? Right? You know what's striking about it? Is that it's the normal object, but it's displaced proportionally from its natural environment. Balance, as opposed to balance, we can, maybe that's a little bit the same. But then there's also resolution. Now, I don't know enough about visual art to talk about resolution in visual art, but I do know more about music. And I can tell you that that's one of the things, if you've ever heard a, a, a passage in music ending on a seventh chord or something like that, you'll notice something missing. It didn't go back to where it should be, which is the root chord. Notice this. Why is beauty, why is art so important? It's not as it was in my high school, to be a subject. You know we had A subjects and B subjects? A subjects, history, science, math, and English. B subjects, art, chorus, band, so forth, garbage. Why should music be, why, it, why should it be a secondary subject in the Middle Ages? It was one of the most important subjects because it's mathematical as well. Art reflects life and it's about life. Let's go very quickly. You see art in life? If we, what, what happens when we don't have symmetry in our lives? Life becomes unmanageable. 
when we don't have proportion, when life is harder to live when we have un and unhealthy, when certain things are distorted out of proportion, when you work too much, which is American's temptation. Yeah. And when you don't have resolution, beautiful music has re resolution. I wish I could play this for you. It's not a religious piece, but it's a beautiful piece by the American composer, Mor uh, uh, Morton Lawrence. I wish I could show it to you, but I can't. Mm -hmm. Let's go quickly. The, the last question, and this is, the, this is why the formation of the human person is so important. Because eventually we get to the question, as we do about humanity, and say, where did humanity come from? Whence is goodness, truth? If there is goodness, truth and beauty in the world, where did it come from? The answer? Because truth, goodness, and beauty are not separate in their origin. They simply are manifested to us differently, but they're really one in God. Why? Because God is a simple being. God doesn't have parts or aspects to him. The transcendentals, truth, goodness, and beauty, they flow from and lead back to God. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in the 1970s, at the University of Kansas, there was a certain professor by the name of John Cena. He started along with two of his colleagues the Integrated Humanities Program. Today, partly as a result of that program, there are men in Clear Creek, Oklahoma, is it? Who are in a monastery, living a contemplative life, to some degree, of, trans of the transcendentals, because they went through that program at the University of Kansas. Now, not to mention two bishops. That's true, Bishop Conley. Is the, went to that program. And Coakley. Coakley. And Coakley, yeah, thank you. Yeah, here's my point. The two, two points, the negative first. The negative is that, is that a program in existence today? No. And why? It was too successful. It was too successful in a particular way because it was leading people somewhere. The second point, as I understand it, when students came to Professor Senior or the other professors and said, you know, everything we're learning here is like leading us to religion, to Catholicism, what did Professor Senior say? Yes, go down, no, no, he said, go down there and talk to the priest. He studiously avoided the, even the appearance of the process. You see, they did not, they did not discuss religion in any, at least in any deep sense, but just as a part of culture. But they introduced people to good truth, goodness, and beauty. And by exposing them to that, they then brought them to God. That's why we need truth, goodness in our world, maybe especially you. The one thing we must remember is this, that God did not remain distant from us, but became incarnate with us. The Logos became flesh. That means that truth, goodness, and beauty did not remain abstract. They came into our world and lived inside a man. And the more that we know Christ, the more we know truth, goodness, and beauty, God wants us to participate. Remember, knowledge is not management, but it's participation in something. It's participating in the transcendentals. How do we do that? This is a quotation from St. John Chrysostom's homily on Blessed Philogonus that he preached in Antioch around the year 386. He says this. He's talking about the altar. In the East, they tend to use the word table for it. When we approach this table with faith, we too will certainly see him lying in the manger. By the way, this was preached five days before Christmas. Yes, or five days before Epiphany. 
when the child is in the manger. You see in the Eastern liturgies of the church, they tend to emphasize replaying the events of salvation history almost visually. He says, we'll see him lying in the manger. And he doesn't mean that metaphorically, by the way. We'll see him lying in the manger. Why? For this table fulfills the purpose of the manger. In other words, why did Jesus, why did God send his son into the world to become flesh? To give us the Eucharist. Because he wanted to put true goodness and beauty inside of us. And when we receive the Holy Eucharist in faith, we receive truth, goodness, and beauty. The Eucharist internalizes Christ into us. And he is the living flesh embodiment of truth, goodness, and beauty. That's what I was speaking about in the first talk today about, I translate this purpose, but the Greek word is toxis, from which we get the word tactile, and so forth. You know, it means the order of things. In other words, God set up a sacramental order in order to get Christ inside of us. Because how could we be saved? Not by faith alone, but by what? By being divinized. By having our human nature made divine. Not leaving behind our human but divinized with theosis to be brought into God by God's grace. He sent his son to do that. And his son is the perfect embodiment of truth, goodness, and beauty. I better stop there.